Thank you all for coming. Um, this is a series that we do for our website, which is funded by the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation. I'm Sarah Messer, and I uh, direct Long Pause Poetry. Um, and it's so this is brought to you by the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation, also Michigan Council of the Arts, and also um, a bunch of other funders like the White Lotus Farms, where Tracy will be reading tonight at 7 p.m. Um, and there's information on little cards out there, and also on our website. Um, I just want to introduce our poet panelists, um, John Woodward, Benjamin Paylaw, Tracy Smith, and Oni Buchanan. Um, and this, this is kind of a funny thing where I always ask poets the same questions. Um, I usually ask 10 questions, and I'm going to ask less today because we have more people, and I want to give everybody a chance to respond. Um, the questions are pretty broad, and uh, you might not like the questions, and that's OK. So. Some people don't like them. Um, and the audience is welcome to uh, ask for more, you know, to say, can you tell me more about that? Or, like, just, it's definitely you can jump in. Um, it's sort of organic. What? Not allowed. It's just <laughs> organic to, like, I don't want to, I'm not going to be like, you, now you, now you, just so, but we're just having a conversation. And if you don't have anything to say about the question, that's fine too. Um, just somebody say something. <laughs> <laughs> so, the first question is, um, what does it mean to make a poem? Stop doing that. <laughs> John and I uh, are once and future surfing buddies. And we used to surf around New England when I was living in Boston. And what the way our conversations typically would go for an hour drive would he would ask me a question, I would talk for about 20 minutes without taking a breath, and then I would ask him a question, and he would answer in about 12 seconds, finishing his answer with a question. <laughs> I don't want that to happen. Okay. You're not answering the question. Well, I mean, to me, it's so, I, what it means to make a poem is when I, uh, when a, a poem for me is made when it's, I mean, the, I guess the question for me would be what is, a, how do I know if I'm looking at a poem that's, that I want to keep reading it over and over again. Um, so what it means to make a poem is to make something that I want to keep, to write something I want to keep reading. I feel like um, most of my poems come out of a sense of either uh, unrest at something I've learned about or something that's happened um, in my world or you know the world um, or a question that I have you know this strange hypothetical urge that I think I might be able to get somewhere with if I just put it into language and so the process um, is a matter of getting as quickly as I can, past what I already think I understand and what I know, and seeing what can happen if I just sort of let language take over, mm -hmm. either in terms of statements or, or the sounds or the images that words can build. And um, um, I don't think, and it's, it's weird because I know at this point in the game there's a good chance that if I write a poem and write another poem and end up with a manuscript, somebody else is going to read it. But the that relationship of with a reader or something that is, is not at all part of the process of like inception or even just the joy of exploration. Um, so that's a, it's almost as though the fact of this poem becoming a poem isn't really um, part of the game, even though it's the, uh, the product that I'm, I'm really excited about getting to, this thing that tells me it's finished, that tells me um, this is something you didn't think you understood. And listen, it's musical too. Um, but I, I like to imagine that it's a private conversation that I'm having with myself and, and whatever it is that's, that's in the vicinity. Um, I, I, I was, my answer was going to be coming from the musical end and, um, and then maybe getting around to saying, oh, and it addresses some question that I didn't understand too. So I, I almost come at it, from, I think, from the the, I don't know if, if it's the opposite direction as what you just described, but um, I'm really curious to have heard you say, and musical too, almost parenthetically, I'm, I'm curious uh, if
if that's just an emergent property of putting words together and, it, and the music sort of is inherently there, or if you think about it in musical terms, or if you hear music before you put words down, or... I almost always start with an idea, so it's like a, it's a cerebral thing, um, but that runs out of steam pretty quickly for me, and I start to say, okay, if I listen to what I just said, if there's something sonic that can push me to say the next few things, and so the music comes in as like an aid to me, and obviously it's something that I love in poetry in general, and I think on an unconscious level, I'm thinking about the sound of what I'm saying, but um, I always feel like I'm, I'm also kind of asking for that to help me out as opposed to being pushed initially by that urge. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I, I'm similar to John in that I'm coming from um, like the musical end of things. Frequently I'm coming from that first. Or, or I'll have like just a kind of motivic obsession of um, like a pattern of words that's stuck, a very small pattern of words that's stuck in my head for some reason. Um, and I have to like physically write, I can't be typing, I have to be like physically writing it out on the page um, to figure out what's, it's almost like a chemical experiment, what connects with this pattern of words, either sonically, like the pattern of vowels and consonants, the, or um, the pattern of accents and, um, and unaccented syllables, or um, imagistic transformations, or just extension. So I'm kind of like trying to take this one motive, as I called it, and just ramify in as many different directions, and then I, and then it's like a, I have um, just like a, a, a placemat of pieces that I, uh, that I'm, I'm combining them in different ways and seeing how they react to one another, and um, it is a, it's very similar to what you're saying in terms of like a process of, of exploration and discovery, because you put two things together that you hadn't previously had side by side, and they produce this third crazy thing or a doorway into a possibility that you haven't considered and, you know, just following those different trajectories and then um, making a decision about the route that ultimately the poem is going to go. That, that reminds me of um, something I was saying to Ryan, who's doing our sound, about um, tone. And I was actually talking about your concert that you guys were doing, and I was saying that um, with the poetry, though, there was this that people were talking about the emotions, and I was saying because it was it was spoken um, in different sections, and the tones were so different, and it causes you to have this emotional response. Because, and I was explaining it in language, it's like a fraction, like one thing on top of another. Basically, what you just said, mm -hmm. and but I was thinking of it in terms of music, where there's two sounds vibrating, but it sounds like you think of language that way too. Like that there's a thing and a thing, and then it makes this other there's something else right. opens up. Yeah, it's great. I think that happens also, I mean, it happens in language through sound and vibration. And it also happens in language through, you know, what happens when two ideas come together. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's like, I think of it as almost like persistence of vision, the way that in film, our minds can will the continuity even though it's actually not there. And I think we have this in the impulse to do that with anything. And so bringing these seemingly disparate ideas or words or context together, um, the fun is, is kind of seeing what they invite uh, between them, even though you know, sometimes it doesn't work, but sometimes. So, so long as they don't come together entirely for me, I actually find that part of what draws me into rereading something is where there's, there's always a gap. Um, there's a, a, what, a writer named Bruno Schultz, a Jewish writer who has been uh, very important to me in, in my in my life and in my work, uh, in various aspects of my life and various aspects of my work, uh, describes poetic language in terms of of um, electrical circuits, mm -hmm. uh, where he he says the way he describes it is that you know words you use the same you apply the same word to the same object over and over again and eventually it just becomes you know I say table and you think immediately of a table. You don't think of the proximate metaphorical uses of tables, say like a water table. Uh, you know, water ta it table is not actually a table, but we've extended it metaphorically to encompass something else. And then there are more distal metaphors where table could possibly come into play. 
Uh, but you know, when we say table, we have this immediate idea of what a table is. And uh, he described, Schultz described this as the word losing its conductivity. Mm -hmm. So that when you take uh, things and place them into a metaphorical relationship where they don't quite come together, mm -hmm. he describes this as restoring the conductivity of the word so that you get spark. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as you can keep coming back to it and you feel spark, you know, read like a really good mom, don't, you, if you can identify immediately what gave you that little jolt, you're not going to get that jolt quite so well the next time around. It's always when there's just some kind of gap between your uh, the stimulus and your command of it. Okay, that's great. That's a great answer to that one. Um, so I'm going to ask this next question, and this is one that lots of people don't like. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> ready? ready? Um, what is the role of beauty in a poem? Well, I think what Benjamin just said is a big part of it. There's a thrill, um, a, I think it is like a spark or something that, that comes from a recognition of something that is, um, I, people say this in so many wonderful ways, and I'm going to say it in a bad way, I'm sure. But, you know, the recognition of, oh, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can remember like this wonderful Emerson quote. We recognize, um, in the genius of others, we recognize our own abandoned. Like we recognize our own abandoned thoughts in the genius of others, and they, they greet us with an air of alienated majesty. So there's something that we recognize as, as familiar, um, or even like potentially familiar in, in those kinds of sparks, right? Maybe we all knew so so much more at one other state or stage, um, and I think that there are moments in poems that bring us close to that kind of thing, and it feels like recognition. And it's often beautiful, but it's really exciting when it's not. And that, you know, adhere to the sense of beauty as something that's measured and organized and balanced. Um, if there's some kind of upheaval, um, if that's part of it as well, I think that for me, that, that's always really thrilling. Can you say the same thing about ugliness in a poem? Um, is it the same, what is the same sense of, of uh, alienated majesty <laughs> or, or whatever? There's a, there's a kind of ugliness where, you know, you know when something just doesn't, doesn't look quite right but you can't look away? Um, okay, no. Because I think I see it quite the way, quite the, the way Tracy does, but but I would rephrase the, I would reframe the question away because different things are going to be beautiful or mm -hmm. we're going to experience this as beauty if we're different people come, or even different us coming at it at a different time. I read differently in the evening than I do in the morning, etc. But um, you might ask, what is the role of lust in reading? Um, <laughs> instead of the role of, of beauty in the poem as though there's beauty that is somehow objectively defined, really what I want is to have that experience of, I can't look away from this. And it's the same as if, you know, it doesn't have to be conventionally uh, beautiful at all. It could be, you know, like sometimes you see someone with a very prominent nose and you just can't stop staring at their nose. That's beauty, you think? No, but it is a kind of lust. I just can't, I, I, you know, it's, it's much like as in a, in a romantic relationship where you, you want this other person, you want to encompass them, envelop them, but you don't want all of the mystery to be gone. You want to be able to look at them and notice differences and changes, but you, it, once you feel like you've completely domesticated this other person, it, it, the, as they say, the magic is gone. That's how I felt about the violin monster when we saw him on the street yesterday. The, the guy, oh, the skinny, the guy, yeah. skinny guy wearing a wolf mask and playing the violin for tips. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to feel that he was domesticated. So we, I think that's part of why we didn't buy his t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also this feeling, um, so that's, I feel like the encounter, that for, that's something about what is alluring, um, and maybe what feels beautiful about the encounter between reader and poem or poet and poem. But then within the poem, I feel like there are moments that, that I at least can say, this is a really beautiful image, or there's something really beautiful that's happening in language. 
And I feel like those moments have to do with language, um, well, for me, and, and this is going to be different for other people, but when language can become so transparent that what's being perceived um, almost feels present. And, and not just that, because that sounds like it's just description, but it's really not just that. It's also about um, being able to look at something in such a way as to allow something that's essential to kind of resonate. And it's, it's hard to describe when and how that happens, but I feel like we've all had experiences of, of seeing an image of the poem and, and feeling you know, pierced by it in a way, um, because it, it, it was just a, you know, the way that like, a photographer can capture a whole narrative and dramatic situation and, and something that's at risk in a still image, and, and it can be transmitted to a viewer. I feel like that, that happens in poems, too. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I think I feel slightly different about the transparency, and I can't tell, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, whether it's an opinion I actually have, or it's just a matter of um, vestigial conditioning from being taught language poetry and so forth, to sort of distrust the idea of um, totally transparent language and imagery uh, that where the, the language itself recedes or, or is, is meant to disappear entirely. Um, and of course there's a whole suite of uh, political concerns involved in, in um, distrusting the idea of political uh, language or about transparent political speech or, or I don't know, I, I, I'm opening up the door to a whole bunch of topics, I guess, but um, I, uh, whether or not it's my own, uh, my own opinion that I, that I fully own or whether it's just sort of vestigial, um, I, I feel, uh, I think I, feel pretty strongly that it's important to, at least for me, to work in a way where the language is not going to lose its materiality, or um, where it won't uh, stop chewing on itself a little bit, um, or make the mouth do something unexpected. Um, and I don't think that's quite the, I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'm contradicting what you're saying, because um, I certainly aim for transparency in images at times too, but I don't know. Do you, do you have any thoughts about that? Oh, um, well, I feel like there's a spectrum, yeah. you know, and we probably are both on it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and even within a single person's relationship to language, there are moments where you hear in different places on that spectrum. Absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, it almost sounds like, Tracy, you're talking about the experience, of, the physical experience of a moment of beauty, like an epiphany. It sounds like an epiphany or some kind of, like, what is that? I mean, I know it's subjective for everybody, but, like, I was thinking about that when you were talking. It's almost like the epiphany, an epiphany or a, um, something to do with the self changing in that moment. Yeah. What we imagine to be moments of clarity. Yeah. And, and experience and you know and in terms of being able to create an experience in language. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's my idea that it's clarity that makes me feel that that kind of tempers my relationship to language mm -hmm. and I, I wish for language to be seen, although it never is transparent or, or at mm -hmm. least willing to recede at moments. Um, I can tell you where the question came from, which was I was working on these translations of AQ, and they were technically correct, um, but they weren't beautiful. And I know that they were beautiful in the original language, and so I was like, well, how do I do that, and what does that even mean? You know? So, because it came out of a, a sort of a this separation of language. That's where it start, I started thinking about the person, you know, just with regular poems. You know. So it's the word beauty that upsets people in that question. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it, I don't know. They, 
I had a friend who's done that. Well, it's, kind of like a trick, it's kind of like a trick question. A little bit. Yeah. These are kind of tricky. Well, yeah. I mean, to put the word beauty out there is, it is I don't know, it's to, I don't know, it's kind of like just dealing in um, stereotype or something. It's not, you don't really mean, it's not defined enough, I guess, and that's what you're, thinking, that's what you're after. You know, it's not like a cookie cutter beauty. And in a way, you can't even say epiphany, because there are, it's, it has a lot to do with a lot of different dimensions. You know, it's, there, there are plenty of poems where the writer has like shoehorned an epiphany in at the end, or like, you know, it doesn't feel like an epiphany because it, it didn't accomplish the work that it needed to accomplish to become transparent or become an epiphany. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, the, the notion of transparency requires like a certain amount of work to achieve, achieve, achieve and it's not just that the language disappears and it may not even disappear and it still, it still could be called transparent, uh, but that like a true epiphany, I mean, it's just, it, yeah. there's all these double language, double meanings going on. There's a big difference between a description of an epiphany and an epiphany. Yeah. And this is one of the really amazing things about a poem as a as like a language technology, is that it can create that. Uh, you know, what we said spark before, but it, it, what 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 Tracy is describing as uh, as a kind of transparency. I guess the word I would, for me, the word I would use would be presence. Like I that, a, it, and it can be an image. It can be emotional. Um, uh, moment, it can be an epiphany, it can be, um, I really like when it's an idea, mm -hmm. and it's not a description of an idea, it is a kind of, it places me in the matrix where I am in conversation with the idea as it's happening, it occurs to me, um, you know, you know this phenomenon like, uh, what is it called, cryptomnesia, cryptomnesia is where you remember something, but you're not, you don't experience it as memory, but as inspiration, you think like, uh, like a great line comes into your mind and then you're like really excited about it and go write it down and write a little poem around it and then you like the, the next day you realize that oh you actually read that in the book you were reading before. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's you know it's related to deja vu it's just a, a, a miss um, it's just a missed pathway neurologically but uh, in a sense reading a poem does that you know, you experience an idea, you experience an image, it becomes present for you in a way that is very different from, say, reading a newspaper article about, you know, man murders and cooks his wife, is what I read yesterday. I don't really want to be present in that experience. I wanted to read about it and know what happened. But it's a very different uh, mechanism in language. Yeah, I, I think I tend to 
Yeah, I think I was sort of born this way, I guess. <laughs> I think, yeah. <laughs> it's a birth defect. There, there's no <laughs> We can rebuild you, we have the technology. <laughs> I, I thought the sonnet thing was, was a very interesting project, and like I sat there riveted totally, you know. Um, and I, but I think it was because there was something um, that I was predisposed to enjoy about that. Was it a structural thing that made you, you know, what were you riveted about? Oh, I, I, don't, I don't know. You know, was it the end drawing pattern? Yeah, the, whole the thing. constraints of the form. Or? The constraints and having some success at it, I guess, was fun. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Music and language all together. I don't know. But I, I, what I'm, what I'm saying is, I think it wasn't that experience that got me hooked. I think I was pretty hooked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you guys? I have a wonderful memory because we still have our next. Um, we, I think I was in the. I'd been I'd written like rhymes and things like that before that, but I remember um, I was in fifth grade and we'd been reading a lot of just a lot of things. But I remember Emily Dickinson and Mark Twain, and I remember writing a poem that was about humor, you know, and thinking I want to make this as brief and as weighty as I can and writing these, these sentences on, you know, on these little line sheets of paper, feeling like I was full of wisdom. I was, <laughs> wisdom. And I was like, no, oh, this is a poem that's ser a serious poem about humor. I like that tension.
I had a lot of different language experiences uh, in school that that were like inspired by teachers and assignments. So in fifth grade, I had a teacher, Miss Miller, and we had to write a story using only the only words with the um, initial of our first name. Um, so uh, in fifth grade, I was born, and all all my words were L. And I was like Lucy had a llama, and she was from Liechtenstein. And, what, you know, like, so that obsession with the letter L, and I just loved like, making these huge lists of L words that I could possibly use, and how was I going to fit them together. Um, I loved that. And before that, in second grade, I had a teacher um, who, uh, like, oh no, uh, yeah, and it happened again in sixth grade, but we had spelling words that we had every week to memorize, and you had a spelling test at the end of the week, and they'd say, say the word, you had to spell it, but between when they gave you the words in the spelling test, you had to write some kind of story using the list of spelling words, and that was like a huge deal for me. Like, I loved figuring out how all the words were related and how I could um, create something out of this very confined list of words. Um, in sixth grade, we had a lot of story writing, and I was always writing like mystery stories and like secret detective stories and. Um, that kind of thing. Oh, and there, and also the, my sixth grade English teacher, Miss Roth. Um, another huge list thing that I loved was we had to come up with homonyms, and it was a competition, which I also loved. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was like who's going to come up with the most homonyms, and then it was like no, there was not a question. I was I was definitely going to win that, and I was like just devoted. I would not I did not sleep. I just like found homonyms for <laughs> forever, and I turned this you know like. Huge, huge list, and it was you know 15 times longer than. Anything. <laughs> but I was like so devoted to it. But while I was doing that, I mean, then then you start seeing those words line up that sound just the same, but they mean something different. And that was really amazing for me. Um, um, as far as like actually writing a poem, I think I, I mean, I had a private journal and I wrote my own. In sixth grade, I remember writing this like long, ridiculous poem, with really heavy-handed symbols, like black is death, you know, kind of symbols. <laughs> <laughs> like the magician, and you know, I don't know, like I had these terrible characters and, and then like would like, uh, you know, put these really, you know, I remember the poems, like it had, it was very melodramatic and it had like a candle beside my bed and the candle and then the magician and black is death and all this <laughs> very profound, I was convinced of my, my profundity. Um, and then in, that was like sixth grade, so I had my own private thing going on. And in seventh grade, I had a teacher who was introducing all of us to poetry, and she gave us these uh, very simple assignments. And I think she underestimated. I mean, seventh graders are smart. Kids are smart, you know. Um, and you know, the kind of assignments she gave us were really um, trite. Uh, like, and so I remember for actual school writing kind of sarcastic responses to the assignments, which I'm a little bit ashamed of, but like I remember her assignments in school were like, okay class, now we're going to write a poem that says, I used to be, but now I am. And so everyone had to write like five lines, I used to be this, but now I am this. And this is seventh grade, I mean that's like fit for like a four-year-old or something, and you know, even four-year-olds could outdo that, right? You know? Yeah. Um, and my poem that I turned in was something like, I used to be an egg, but now I am a chick. I used to be a chick, but now I am a chicken. I used to be a chicken, but now I am a sandwich. And that, that <laughs> <laughs> that's what I actually like signed my name to and turned in. I was a vegetarian too. I just thought it was like on the level with what she was giving me. So my response was like, you know, but in private I had my like, own very profound poetry going on. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 um, but I can see how all those other assignments, the spelling and the homonyms and the you know writing with a single letter, like really affected me. And um, pl like plus games with um, um, my dad's neighbor that had two children that were my sister and my age, and we played with the um, neighbor. So it was four girls, and we always made these like crazy adventures, and we were, you know, different characters, and we, we um, did a lot of coding, like, like we had secret languages and had codes for, for letters and for words, and, and um, that had a huge effect on, on me too, but school was a little 
I'm, cu I'm curious, did either of you guys go through the, the thing of, you know, writing lyrics to a, a Cure B-side? Uh, <laughs> I definitely did. But, really? Yeah, oh yeah, you know, death, dying, maggots, yeah. my brain sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I had a lot of dark stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't do that? No. You mean write lyrics to go with No, not, no, no, not, for, no, not for, like something of that, uh, oh. you know, that kind of really Really dark, the goth. gothy kind of melodramatic thing. Um, yeah, nice. You didn't. I'm black, so I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I think that, that makes sense to me. Is that a thing? That you just, what do you write? Uh, no, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> it never occurred to me. No, I wrote a lot of patronizing poems too, like thinking that I was like, super clever. Yeah, I don't know. Like I, I was like, I'm gonna relate to. I remember writing, I shouldn't even say this out loud, but I, I remember thinking like about, I mean my mother used to work with um, mentally handicapped children when, when, when I was growing up. Um, and I remember thinking a lot about it and like what is it like to be trapped inside a body and not be able to express yourself. Um, and so I remember writing poems about that and then when I read them now they're just like horrifically offensive, you know, that kind of thing. But I was trying really hard to relate, mm -hmm. but it ends up being mm -hmm. super patronizing in the end. But yeah, <laughs> that was high school endeavor. <laughs> but my first poem oh, oh, was sort of dark, and it was very yeah, it was dark. But it wasn't dark like maggots. It was yeah. called fences, and it was like everybody's separated and they can't reach each other. Yeah. It's raining. It's existential. Mm -hmm. and, I know. <laughs> I remember though thinking like this is a poem, and I had that same feeling of like. I gotta get through to people. <laughs> they need me. Yeah. <laughs> problem with this situation. Like they gotta hear this. <laughs> but it's that I feel like it is the same impulse, even though it's handled differently at that age, yeah. of wanting to um, put language into a place where it doesn't seem like it's capable of fitting, or where you know at least. You know, we don't have a habitual language for describing certain kinds of feelings, especially the feelings that undo you most at that age. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like that's still what we are doing, but mm -hmm. we just have different relationship to A, language, and B, life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, a, there's a, it's a kind of rehashing, or it's a, it's a new stage of, of uh, this thing that, that you know, one year olds do that linguists call canonical babbling. And the kids just say like buh, 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 over and over again. They're just uh, perfecting sounds. And they have stuff to say, they just don't have the tools to say it. But they're trying to put the basic building blocks together. And the same thing kind of happens as you're learning how to, how to write. You don't really have the material. Which is why, you know, as a teenager, you're like, oh, but I have these feelings. There's so many if only I could get them out. But you just don't really have the material to get them out yet. So you put it together, you try to build the machine. Yeah. I love this discussion. It's great. <laughs> 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 you just keep talking about it. Um, but I actually want to ask one more question um, because I think this would, especially with this group, um, how do sound and vision, meaning when I say vision, it's maybe visual image, um, intersect? in the poem, or when you're writing a poem, or just in poetry in general, how did, I mean, you've talked about it a little bit already. Um, I guess this is coming from, like, the idea of, it could also be how it looks on the page, you know, or like the line, um, you know, Olson's idea of the projected verse, or in the connected to breath, or sound or whatever. I mean, so I'm just wondering how sound and then visual, visual imagery, and, and even including the how it looks on the page, um, plays. It was really interesting for me to go back and read John's book on Kenny Valley after hearing it. Um, it was such a different experience. And it's such a different experience. Like, I didn't think about how the poem looked on the page at all when I was listening. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then when I went back to read it, now I have this totally different experience of reading that book, having heard your piece. Do you know what I mean? And then also, I think, I guess I 
I didn't get to say this to you, but uh, maybe I did. There's, there are moments in this concert that these guys gave a few days ago um, up on Canyon Valley um, where you're, you are getting transported by the sound and the repetition and the music, but then there are these visual images like the tree, the really tall tree with no limbs with a baby head. And that will not leave me. And, like, and then the lion, I yeah, think I mentioned yeah. that. The lion shows up, suddenly this lion. And the trees falling across the road. And like, so those things suddenly like appear. Um, again, though, it was an experience of hearing it and then suddenly seeing something. Um, I don't know, this is kind of a big question, but just if you want to <laughs> somehow. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer for myself. I feel like some people really could come at it from sound and then try to do something with the page about that. And um, some people come at it from image. If I can answer a little bit specifically about the okay. piece you're referring to, or the, the poem that it's, mm -hmm. that it's based on. But, um, that was a combination of uh, sound and image all together that basically came out in one, uh, in one long sitting. Um, I had had a dream the night before um, that had all of the building blocks of images, um, where uh, there was, you know, some sort of car accident involved, um, people that were too far away to see properly, um, me pushing over a tree onto them, and um, I'm realizing maybe I'm going through my goth phase now. <laughs> <laughs>
but but as a heritage for sure, a backwards look, yep. not not a forwards or a yeah. sideways. Yeah. But I also feel like it was even more powerful because it was placed where it was, yeah. and Definitely. it was foreign, yeah. um, and it caused that thing I was talking about, like that dome. And it was just a fun yeah. It was really interesting to see what John Gibson did with that musically because, I mean, in the poem by itself, in John's poem alone, the, the lion appears like that in the middle, I mean, and it has that same effect, but how John said it was that the movement before was the like wildest, craziest inside the piano stuff of the entire piece where I'm like scraping a plastic card against the bass strings and um, you know, making all these sounds, and John has the repeated of, 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 of going on, and all the ricocheting of. So it's like he just went off the deep end, and then he put the lion and the nostalgia movement right afterwards. It's like, it was a really good placement. Um, very dramatic rescue, in a way, <laughs> uh, from, from the, the abyss that we descended into. The plumbing pipes of this. So specifically with that poem, it's, it was all very, I don't know if it was related, I think so, but I don't know how to say how it was, but it was definitely simultaneous and all emerged whole at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, in general, I was just going to say quickly, and then I don't want to hear what you were going to say, um, but in general, I think it depends for me on the exigencies of whatever it is I'm working on. So it could be very image-based, and then it's, that's, I'm going to focus on that, or the Well, I, I mean, I'm still talking about your poem. I want to hear about you, you know, your answers. Yeah, um, but I was going to say about the Uncanny Valley poem, the way those images um, accumulate and they stick in your mind or whatever. They have this quality of being landmarks. You know, like, okay, the tree, the seven trees, and the seven people, and here's the accident, and I'm going to push it over, and there's a robot in the sky. And, like, you have all these crystalline landmarks, but then you're trying to thread them together in a way that, I mean, they're presented as if they make total sense. They're presented like, okay, here's the here's the mythology, and this is what happened, and and you're like given this information um, in a very clear way. I mean, surrounded by language that's that's repeating in an opaque way. Um, you're given these crystalline images, but then it, honestly, like when you're given them, you're like that, that doesn't make any sense. You're, that really doesn't make sense. You know, even though it's given to you in a way that's so clear that presumes it makes sense, part of the conflict is that it doesn't add up, you know, while, like the time keeps slipping back on itself in the story, like things keep repeating in ways that don't fit together narratively, but you're given these clear figurines of imagery that supposedly line up and you're left just juggling shards of stuff, you know, and that's an interesting effect of, of how he's using really clear imagery against a, a voice and a timeline that really confuses how you deal with them. What do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> well, how did, can you say the question? Oh, um, how do sound and vision intersect in your poems? Do you want to go first? No. <laughs> I do, that's, it's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> you keep revising the, the revising You're the like, question. You're like, why do you revise the question? Because no, for me it's a, because it's, you know, I, I do find actually in both print and in, in meetings like this, the, the, the thing that gets talked around uh, in discussing poems, usually because we, we default to sound and image, sometimes very appropriately, is idea. Uh, and for me, idea is really a, a very essential element. Uh, it doesn't always go in this order, but typically when I'm, when a poem is starting to, to, when I'm starting to work out a poem, it's because I, uh, some sound has jumped out at me. Typically, it's something I've overheard because I'm a, a, an incorrigible eavesdropper. And, uh, and something that's, you know, a certain turn of phrase or peculiarity in the way uh, sometimes everyday language, but often it's some, somehow very idiosyncratically warped language, will stick in my mind and I'll hear it and it will suggest 
to me an idea that is not directly related to the circumstance where that language appeared. It will suggest a kind of alternative life to that language. And I will mull over that. And as I mull over it, it will suggest itself to me in images that are typically images that I have observed and that stuck in my mind but are only recalled by mulling over this idea in relation to the language. Uh, so that when images appear in my in my poems, uh, they're almost always literal. You know, like that crazy. You know, I read two poems last night about bus rides where crazy things are happening on the bus. All that stuff happened on the bus. It's just it was a crazy bus. Um, a guy in a three cornered hat, dude wearing a Hitler mustache. Um, all that stuff actually I saw on a bus, but it was really just because something that I had overheard suggested a set of ideas that I couldn't work out in other work, because I do other kinds of writing where I can, um, in a sense, anatomize the, the idea and make it make sense for me. I can kind of domesticate it that way. Um, that's not what poems are for, for me. Poems are for the, the, they run on the unresolved idea, but it helps uh, me not assimilate it, but uh, carry it with me by suggesting certain images that are otherwise stored up from watching movies or you know, walking down the street or whatever. Uh, but it, it has to be the interplay of the sound, um, the, the image, and the idea. Um, yeah, I don't know that I really have a lot to add. I, um, I'm, there was a period many years ago when I went through what felt like a very debilitating writer's block and I took up photography as just a way of doing something creative while I wasn't writing. And um, so I feel like I learned a lot about, or at least my relationship with the visual world kind of began. And so an image, although my poems often also start with an idea, um, the image is <clears throat> kind of always at hand, and if I get to a place where I am trying to figure out how to get an idea into language, I'll often say to myself, if I were a silent film, what would I show that might, you know, have some of this, and, and that, that is really helpful to me still as a writer. But I'm also really interested in silence, so, you know, and, and what is, what sits between the things that are said. Um, and I, I hope the silences are also active presences in, in my work. And I know also when my students have poems where the things get, okay, so there's activity and momentum and that can be wonderful. And then there's, there's um, antsy movement and um, agitated and restless or, or desperate seeming images and things that are happening um, and often I feel like those are the moments where something if we can take as much of that away there's there's something that's very quietly powerful that the poem is nervous about and if you can calm the poet down and just say let it happen don't don't do all the bells and whistles then that's going to be like the weightiest moment of the poem um, so I don't really know how you put silence in a poem but sometimes I feel like the charge of the poem is to listen for those places where you can sort of step back any of you want to say anything about your own poems? Um, well, yeah, I have a very strong relationship with imagery. Um, and I do start with uh, ideas a lot of times, and, and especially if like, this relates to John's dreamscape or whatever, the emotions behind it. So like, I, I'll have like, a very, very strong emotion or an idea, but that idea has to be surrounded by its emotional tenor. I need to identify what that is. Um, and from that, in, like from embodying that emotion to the best of my ability, like you just start getting populated with images that contain, I mean the reason I love images is because they contain all the complicated emotional information um, and a lot of directional possibilities in this one radiating image. And um, so I come up with images that way through this kind of distillation 
process without giving up. I mean, I don't want to domesticate it. That's its opposite. I want it to retain all of its chaos. And that's what images can do, because they don't reduce something. They, they just read information. Um, and it's the same with how I learn music. I mean, there's a lot of instructions that I need at, at my disposal in a second, in a microsecond, you know, a split second's time. If I'm on the stage and I have to be playing something, that, that's, I need this information right now. Um, I need it before I have to, you know, I need it the microsecond before I have to play. Um, but at home, when I'm dividing everything up and figuring everything out, it's going really, really, like I slow down the time very much. And it's like you approach the key in a certain way, you play the key in a certain way, you release the key in a certain way, and you need a sound, and you need an emotion, you need a, a, um, um, a voice, uh, how is it spoken, how is it, what's the cadence. And, it, and I have to think about all those separate pieces of information, and what I do is create an image out of all the information that I can access in a split second, and I know everything and I can play whatever I need to. So I have these like image cues that are like, okay, now, now I'm a panther and I'm walking on moss. Now I'm a whatever. And I know everything I need to know to produce a sound I need to play. And it's, and it's all the information in one thing. Um, and it's the same with cadence of speech and that applies directly to writing all poetry. Like you don't, see, in different emotional situations, you don't speak in the same way. You're not like, and now I am in a fire building is burning down. It's like, you know, you're like the accents start like clustering in crazy, crazy ways. And again, it's, it's just, for me, it's just um, embodying an emotion and then trying to say words in that state. You're not going to speak in iambic pentameter if your house is on fire and you're inside the top floor or whatever. You're going to, you're going to, I don't, I'm not embodying that right now, but the accents are going to get all messed up and you're going to shout a lot of words together that don't belong together in other circumstances or whatever, and a lot of energy is going to come out. So, I guess, I mean, the sound and images both, for me, relate to the emotion that's behind them. And the vowel choice, I mean, everything. It's, it's the vowel choice, that, how the consonants line up, how the vowels move, how the line moves, what, so, you know, if you're using only one syllable words, or what, you know, I mean, it's all related to me, to the emotion that's behind. Well, we're out of time. Thank you guys so much. Um.